Okay, good. <coughs> good evening to everyone. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm not going to speak who am I. You can read it afterward, it's okay. Uh, what I'm going to, say, to speak today is really about the importance of immune deficiency, but the new aspect how we looked at immune deficiency. But you know, when you are giving a talk at 7 a.m., at 7 p.m., it's late. And you have to see how you can attract the, uh, the people. Because you see, there was a paper in the British Journal, a medical journal about 20 years ago, who said about dreaming during scientific paper, a fact of added extrinsic material. And you can see here, at the law, it's written, you can't see it. One moment. Is there a pointer here? This. Okay, here you don't see it, but it said that out of the audience of 14 people here, two are looking straight, four with fixed eyes, and seven with closed eyes. <laughs> and the question is, how do you rise? So you can do extrinsic material, like for example, showing you from where I'm coming, from Haifa, which is a beautiful city in the Mediterranean, very nice city with the Baha'i with the Baha'i Temple. One moment, with the Baha'i Temple here, it's a very beautiful city. But I believe that you will be interested in my talk even without me showing you such beautiful uh, pictures. So I would like to start with a confession. You see this picture. This was the head page of a very important journal. It's called Immunology Today. Now it's called Trend in Immunology. It's one of the leading journals in immunology, mainly key reviews. And here down, you can't see it again, it's, called, it's written, Admiration of the Mouse. What is the meaning of it? We immunologists used to admire very much the mouse here. Why? Because when we learned about the immune system, we learned many things through the mouse. And I use the confession that I'm doing now is that I used to say up to about four or five years ago that essentially the difference between the mouse immune system and the human one is not a big one. Why is it? Because already in the mouse, it came to a, some kind of a perfect immune system that the mouse can survive. And therefore, <coughs> during evolution, we didn't have to change much as human being. Because already in the mouse, much below in evolution, we already arrived to a perfect state. And therefore, we can learn much more from the mouse. And we don't have the human experience to need also because already everything is in the mouse. But it seems like that now we understand that this is not the case. And our immune system is not as perfect as we used to think. So what is immune deficiency? So the definition is that immune deficiency comes from a diverse groups of abnormalities in the immune system, resulting in a primary increase in the incidence of infection. Now we know that it can be primarily due to genetic defect or secondary, you know, the most famous if secondary immune deficiency is uh, HIV AIDS. So this was to be used to be the definition of immune deficiency. And there is a very, this, this cartoon I took from a friend of mine, uh, <coughs> Dick Steam from the United States. And what he says here that if infection are chronic, recurrent, unusual, invasive, and severe, then you have to evaluate. Because if you don't fail to cruise may lead to a titanic disaster. <laughs> and I believe that we will learn more, we will hear about more it later on. Immune deficiencies are rare, but you have to uh, think about them. And those are the 10 warning signs, recurrent deep skin infection, for example, persistent thrush in the mouth. All those 10 warning signs are important. But the question is, are those have to be changed during the years? And indeed, from the UK about a year ago, there was a study done to look what is the main cause that people come to the attention that afterwards they are discovered to, be, to suffer from primary immune deficiency. And in this study, they came up to the conclusion that if you get intravenous antibiotics, it's the main thing that afterwards, if you needed intravenous antibiotics, the probability that you will have some kind of problem in the primary immune deficiency is the leading cause to think about primary <coughs> immune deficiency. The most famous child with primary immune deficiency is David. 
Davis was born in the early 70s when his brother died from a severe combined immune deficiency, meaning that both his T and his B cell function, meaning that both his cellular, the cells do not know how to work and also the antibodies which are produced are not working if they are produced at all. So when David was born, at that time there was not a prenatal diagnosis for the disease. But because his brother had the disease, at the day he was born, they did a very simple test at that time, just to look whether he has lymphocytes, which are the main cells that protect us in, the, uh, in neurology. And they found that he didn't have uh, T cells, uh, lymphocytes, and therefore they understood that he is suffering from severe combined immune deficiency. And he was put into a sterile environment, which is called the bubble boy, and he kept like, he was keep, kept like that until the age of 12. At the age of 12, when bone marrow transplantation became more used, because, because he didn't have a brother, for sure he couldn't have a match full donor. So he co could have only what is called half match donor, his father or his mother. Anyway, they took the cells from his father, they did the bone marrow transplantation, and unfortunately he died from, a, at that time, a very severe complication a virus which was in the father was transmitted to the child and because it takes about three months for the immune system to recover in this child, at that period he is very vulnerable to diseases and he got the virus from his father, it's called epstein barr virus and he died from a fatal epstein barr virus. Nowadays we have many ways to treat against those, this virus and therefore people are not, will not die from uh, EBV after transplantation. But David is the example of a severe combined immune deficiency and essentially he lived so long because they understood at the day he was born that he has the disease. And the main problem is to make the diagnosis as early as possible. And therefore, nowadays also there is a big Also in the United States, uh, uh, here in, uh, in England, they pushing towards doing neonatal screening tests for severe combined immune deficiency. Because if you make the diagnosis, the survival rate are much higher. And you can see in this slide, for example, if you make the diagnosis in the first 100 days of life, the percentage of survivors is almost 100% because you make bone marrow transplantation very early, there is no complication, you still don't have any infection in your body, and therefore the recovery is much better, and you survive, you can see, more than 95%. But if you will make the diagnosis early, uh, later in life, you can see that, for example, if you make the diagnosis only at a, about a year of age, then the survival is only 50%. And therefore it's very important to make the diagnosis much earlier. And if you can see here, this is also a study from the UK. What they have done, they looked whether the, the, the diagnosis was at a proband or a sibling. And of course, if there is a sibling, the diagnosis has been made much earlier. And you can see here, the mean age of diagnosis was between one day, of, but up to more than a year, while here it was mainly in the first months of life. And you can see the death before you do a bone marrow, a, a <coughs> stem cell transplantation was already 35%, while here it was less than 2%. And overall survival is only 40% here, while here it's above 90%. So therefore it's very clear that we have to diagnose those patients as early as possible. And the problem is that it's difficult to make the diagnosis at the first few days of life if you don't have a family history for several reasons. First of all, it's rare. So if something is rare, you don't think about it so much. Secondly, the inf infections are common in all children, not just those with immune deficiency. So if your chi child comes to you with an infection, you won't think at the beginning of, of primary immune deficiency you will think that just they have an infection and you will delay the diagnosis. And 
sometimes, as I told you, history, family history is uh, missing. And mainly, when you make the examination of a child with severe combined immune deficiency, he is completely normal when he is born. And therefore, you don't suspect that he is suffering from primary uh, immune uh, deficiency. And as you know, the mother transfer immunoglobulins to the child. And therefore, in some condition, the delay, the infection will start later in life after six or eight months uh, of life. Now, if you want to make a, a screening for neonatal, uh, for any neonatal uh, diseases, you have to take into consideration several aspects. First of all, is the disease a serious one? Should we do it? So for sure, a severe combined immune deficiency is very severe and it's fatal in the first, fear, uh, first year of life if you, if you don't treat it. Disease is not detected by examination. As I told you, it's not detected. Ch newborns with skid appears completely healthy. Incidence supporting swinging. So you can see, for example, for a PKU, it's one in 10,000. In a Beardudine deficiency, it's one in 80,000. 80, and we are speaking about a one in 50,000 worldwide. But in Israel, for example, because of a high consanguinity in some of the uh, parts of Israel. Therefore, we came to the conclusion, we made a study in Israel, and it's one in 15,000, meaning that it's not so rare. And therefore, it's worthwhile screening for it. Well-established confirmation tests. There are several confirmation tests which make the diagnosis uh, firm, and therefore, we have it. Effective treatment exists, for sure. If you do transplantation early in life, it's effective, as I showed you and therefore it worth doing it. And earlier treatment is better. I have shown you that indeed the survival. The survival is much better if you do the diagnosis early. Diagnosis and treatment is viable. For sure, there are in all, in most Western countries, there are centers where they do transplantation and Screening is cost effective. So the question is indeed whether it's cost effective. And I just want to show you the next slide. With the look in the United States, how much a child with skid who needs transplantation, how much it costs. So you can see, if you make the diagnosis before the age of three and a half months, it costs about $100,000. But if you do it later in life, because the child needs antibiotics, and therefore, after the transplantation, it has many complications, and it takes much more time to be cured. And sometimes, as I told you, he, he will die. But essentially, you can see that the price goes to almost half a million dollars. And therefore, even if we speak about money-wise, it's cost-effective to do the uh, screening. Now, to explain to you what is the screening, I will do it very simplified. When you make antibodies or T cells, those two, two arms of the immune system, in order to get the specificity that we need of an antibody to attack only this kind of uh, bacteria or this kind of virus, the immune system the, in the uh, DNA, there is, what, is, what, is what we call that part of the DNA, the joining part, which is called the V, J, and D, and J region here. They join together. When they join together, a part of the DNA is making a circle, and this circle is, a, 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 is not mixed with the other part of the DNA. And you can check for this part. And this part exists when you have T cells who are doing, who are... Uh, one second, please. So in this part of, when the T cell is starting from a very immature T cell to become a mature T cell, which knows how to fight against viruses, for example, in these stages of uh, proliferation, he produced this part, which is called the track. And therefore, if we measure it and we find track, it means that there are T cells 
which are propagating to become <coughs> mature T cells. And if we don't find the track, it means that there are no mature, mature, mature T cells, meaning the immune system is defective. And this is a screen that can be done, you can see here, with the known, you know that every child with what is called the Gatri, a blood test, it's a card that we put <coughs> dropped of blood, and we can check many kinds of uh, diseases in this, uh, whether the child has it or not. So you can use the same Gatri filter paper, and from this tiny amount of blood, you make the DNA, and then you measure to see whether the track exists or not. And it's a very <coughs> sensitive uh, assay which can really help us to make the diagnosis if the patient has or doesn't have a severe combined immune deficiency. Just to show you an example, in the States, there are several, uh, uh, in, the, in the United States, several states are already doing it. And for example, you can see here in uh, California, they checked half a million uh, newborns, and out of those half a million newborns, they came out to uh, 50, per, uh, 50 per newborns with, uh, which were uh, suspected of having uh, primary uh, severe combined immune deficiency. And at the end, you can see that 20 of those were abnormal, meaning that one in 25,000 births have a, a, a severe combined immune deficiency, which is double than what was estimated. So just to show you that in the, in the states, there are several uh, states like California, Wisconsin, uh, Massachusetts, which are doing the screening test, and I think it's something that will develop and will be part in all uh, the Western world and will really save life of many children. Okay, so what is the real incidence of primary immune deficiency? Do we know exactly what it is? So I just want to show you a study that was done in the United States where they did 10,000 phones and asked just a simple question. Does anyone in your family has primary immune deficiency? That was the question that would ask. And you can see that the number came up that in the United States, it's about more than 200,000 who have primary immune deficiency just by phoning household uh, uh, to, to see whether they have primary immune deficiency in the family. And a study that was recently published <coughs> made some uh, mathematical uh, uh, calculation and found out that if you took the estimate of about 7 uh, billion uh, p uh, people around the world, there is more, there is one estimate which will say that there is about 6 million, others say that there is about uh, almost a million, but it's quite clear that those uh, primary immune deficiency are not rare as we thought. They are much more common than we thought, and I will show you what I mean by it. For example, I want to take you to a very famous family, the Pasteur family. Look at the Pasteur family. Three of their kids died at, at a very young age, before the age of 15. Well, how come? Why three in one family will die so early? Is it just by chance, or is there something bad in the genes which, which cause them early death. Well, for many years we didn't know about anything about it. And the classical uh, classification of primary immune deficiency was a patient with a known defect in the immune system. But essentially, what is immune competent is the ability to mount a normal immune response to a pathogen. Meaning that if I don't mount, a normal response, meaning I'm very sick and I, I'm going to die from an infection, whether I found a defect in the immune system or whether I don't find, still I'm immune deficient because I couldn't fight the infection uh, as normally as someone else will do. So therefore, even if I don't find the defect, I must have some immune system and I will show you uh, some examples. The first example is a child that we had in the hospital this girl was a very nice uh, baby, uh, Lihi, and she was completely normal, no problems. But then, at the age of one, uh, almost in a one and a half year, she developed very high fever, and we found out that she had meningitis due to a bacterial, it's called pneumococcal meningitis. She got antibiotics, and she recovered completely. So now, what should we tell the, the <coughs> parents? Okay, it was bad luck, or maybe there's something else. 
So just to show you another patient, this patient was from Paris, and this patient also suffered from pneumococcal meningitis, and afterwards he has an infection in his bones, but from the age of one year until the age of eight at that time, he was completely normal. When they checked his immune system, as we knew at that time to check the immune system, we found out that both his uh, humoral immunity and the cellular immunity was completely normal. So we would say at that time, okay, this child doesn't have any immune deficiency, okay, because all the tests were completely normal. But he had a cousin, and the cousin also suffered from pneumococcal meningitis. So the probability that just by chance two cousins will have a severe disease, not at the same time, but several years apart, said that maybe there is a defect here. And a very known uh, immunologist by the name of uh, Jean-Laurent Casanova, he's not what you think, he's not the Casanova <laughs> from, uh, from somewhere else, but Jean-Laurent Casanova looked more in depth and he found out that those two children have a mutation in a gene which encode for a protein which is called IRAC4. And later on, he found out that other people with pneumococcal meningitis have a defect in a gene which produces a protein which is called MYD88. Now, in order to explain to you what are those two very shortly, we have to understand that our immune system is composed of two main arms. One we used to say, one is the cellular and one is the humoral. But now essentially we divide it into what we call adaptive immunity and innate immunity. What is the meaning of innate immunity? It's meaning that this immune system that we are born with, that in evolution goes back one million years back. On the other hand, the adaptive immune deficiency is a very sophisticated Immune uh, uh, immunity, which compose of the T cells and the antibodies, which recognize specific part in a prot in a, in a bacteria or in a virus, while the innate immunity, which is much older in evolution, recognize the whole cell, the whole bacteria. It doesn't recognize be bet between a streptococcal or staphylococcal. It recognizes all the uh, bacteria together and therefore it's not as sophisticated as the adaptive. Now, in the innate immune response, there is something which is called toll-like receptors. Those are receptors which recognize foreign particles and when these foreign particles will bind to those toll-like receptors, they will activate, this is the cell membrane, they will activate several proteins in the cells, which eventually will go into the nucleus <coughs> and will produce the pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are important to fight infection. Now, what Jean Lorraine found, that there is a mutation, can be a mutation here or here. So it's quite clear if you don't have this protein or this protein, therefore the whole cascade will not go down and you will not produce the pro-inflammatory cytokine. So this is an example where you have a severe primary immune deficiency which was not recognized with the known you, uh, uh, normal uh, uh, test that we are doing today. But remember, this is still rare. It's not something common. Up to now, about maybe less than 100 patients were, were found to have those conditions. So the second example that I want to show you is about another disease, which is called herpes simplex encephalitis. It's an infection in the brain. Now, this infection is not, co is not very rare, it's quite common. And again, the question is, why do someone develop herpes virus, which a, a, a virus in the brain, while other people do not? Is it just bad luck? So again, our friend Casanova did several studies which showed he looked in, in France at uh, about, nine, now it's much more, but it, he started with 86 pa uh, patients with herpes simple encephalitis, and he found out, you can see those, the mutation in many proteins, in several different proteins. What are those proteins? Again, and we go to the toll-like receptor that we spoke before, 
Toll-like receptor number three is the one, is the one which recognizes mainly viruses. And then, again, through a cascade of proteins, just like here, but other type of proteins, it will produce in the nucleus interferon, which is known to be a very strong antiviral protein. So if you have mutation here, for sure you won't have interferon, and therefore you will develop the uh, brain uh, infection. Again, all those kids, if we test, test them normally, we won't find any immune deficiency. But still, you can see that if there are mutation, you will have a disease. But those are still rare. But now we come to the main point. And if you have to remember anything from my talk, I want you to remember this slide. Look at this slide. The life expectancy 10,000 years ago <coughs> was about 50 is here, go down, about 25 years. At the age of 25 years, this was the life expectancy. If you go through history, you can see that even if you look at uh, Mozambique in Africa in 2000, nowadays, you can see that still it's about 35 to 40. And only in the Western world, like for example in the UK now, you can see that it's about 80. Now you have to understand that the difference in 10,000 years genetically wise is a very, it's a, like a second. The genes are not changing so quickly that the whole population will be changed. So for sure, it's not a genetic that <coughs> makes this change. Now remember, all those patients here, all those people who died here very early in life, none of them died from a road accident. None of them. <laughs> okay? So what did they die of? All of them died from infection. So if they die from infection, it means that their immune system is not perfect. But as I told you, genetically it can't be that now our immune system is perfect. So what is the difference between here and here? There are three main things. First of all, it's the hygiene. As you may know, up to about 150 years ago, no one understood the importance of washing hands. Only now we, we put so much attention to it. But after 150 years ago, no one understood it. Secondly, all the vaccination. We don't see polio now, smallpox, etc., etc. So the vaccination is in, in important and, for sure, antibiotics. So in those ways, we are helping our defective immune system by, give, by our brain, we help the immune system by giving antibiotics, by washing hands, by, by giving vaccination. Now, is it, is it indeed so? So I want to take you into very quickly about two or three examples. The first one is a very interesting uh, study that was published quite a long time ago in the New England. And what it wanted to look whether uh, several kinds of diseases like cancer, infections, or uh, cardiovascular are due to genetic or to the environmental factors. So what they did, they took uh, 1,000 adoptees and they looked whether the disease was associated with something in their biological parents or their adoptee parents. Because if it's the adoptee, it meaning the environment. If it's the uh, biological one, it means that it's genetics. And you can see that if we speak about infection, if one of the biological parents died from an infection episode, the probability that also his biological son will die from infection is about 10%. But if there was no infection in the biological parents, the probability that the child will die from an infection is almost nil. Meaning that there are some genetic factors here that still up to that time in, 80, in 1988 we didn't know about that cause you to be more susceptible to an infection. So as I told you, the conventional classification of primary immune deficiency goes whether it's a combined immune deficiency, cellular, humoral, complement, phagocytic defect, etc. But is it the right way to, uh, to think about immune deficiency? For example, there is something which is called IgA deficiency. IgA deficiency is the most common immune deficiency that exists. 
in about one in 500 approximately of the uh, healthy persons have primary, uh, have IgA deficiency. They are completely healthy. They don't have anything. But if you open any book in immunology and you open the chapter of immune deficiency, you will find a paragraph of, of, of about IgA deficiency. Although they don't have any problems infection-wise. So why do we call them immune deficient? On the other hand, if you die from an infection, but you, can't, you didn't find any uh, defect, you call it immune competent. Are they immune competent? I don't think so. So let me take you. So this is just that we are proposing now the definition. A patient who, who does not survive an infectious episode is immune deficient, essentially. And I want to take you, I will skip this because it's a little bit more complicated and I will go to uh, this, uh, to two examples to show you what I mean. So we know that millions of people are infected yearly with tuberculosis. 5% of them, it's only 5 but still it's a lot of people, will develop pulmonary TB. So the question is, what about those 5%? Why those two 5% <coughs> develop pulmonary TB? The question is, is it a vir virulent pathogen or a defective immune response? So I want to put another concept that I just want you to understand about, which is called polymorphism. In the genetic, the genetic variation between one person to the other will be or a mutation, which is quite rare. A mutation is quite rare. And normally it can cause, nowadays it can cause a disease. So what I showed you, for example, in the toll-like receptor 3, on the ARAC4 are mutation in the gene which cause the dysfunction or disappearance completely of, of this protein and therefore a severe infection and these are, those are rare conditions. On the other hand, there is something which is called polymorphism and those are minor changes which exist in all of us. For example, my nose is longer than yours because of polymorphism, because the genes which are important for the construction of the nose, have some small difference. Still, my nose functions completely normal, and yours fu function completely normal. I hope so. <laughs> but <laughs> essentially, those polymorphisms, the small changes, may, may be important in some issues. So what they did in this study, they looked at various uh, proteins which are known to, to be important in the protection against tuberculosis. And they want to see if there is any change in the polymorphism between the group who has pulmonary TB with, uh, and those who are infected with TB but do not have the pulmonary disease. So they looked at several uh, uh, pro, uh, uh, genes. One of them is called MCP1, which is known to be important for the immune defect against mycobacterium. And you can see here that when they took, this is a big study, and we, uh, you can see there is about 900 patients altogether. So if you took a normal population, healthy population, you can see that, for example, in another gene, which is called Rantes, which is also important for the defense against TB, the, there is a, a, a force have the A polymorphism, and three force have the G polymorphism, and whether you have just where you infected with TB and you didn't develop pulmonary TB or you developed pulmonary TB, it's exactly the same and therefore there is no significance. But when they looked at the MCP1, you can see that in the normal population, the A and G polymorphism are divided almost equally, 50%, 50%. And if you look at those with, who were infected, it's exactly the same. But when you look at those with pulmonary TB, you can see that the G phenotype is much more uh, common than the A. It doesn't mean that everyone who has the, the G are, is suffering from pulmonary TB, but it's quite clear that the G, if you have uh, the G phenotype, you are a little bit more susceptible to have pulmonary TB. So there's something here to, be, to see exactly if this is true. Look at those numbers here. If you look, as I told you, the IL-12, you saw in the last slide before, that IL-12 is important <coughs> in the defense. It's a protein which is important in the defense of against tuberculosis. So you see, if you are homozygous for the AA genotype, 
the level is 1400, okay? If you are homozygous for the GG, it's 1100. You have to remember that both those numbers are between what we call the normal range. So if we just make, we see it's the normal range. But pres presumably that if you have a lower, it's still, although it's, it's not like when you have a mutation that it will be here zero. You have almost normal number, but presumably this number gives you some kind of susceptibility to uh, infection. And the second uh, study that I want to show you is something against doing polymorphism on a, a protein which is called CASP12. CASP12 is known to be important again in the immune system. So when you look at the polymorphism of CASP12, there are two kinds of uh, polymorphism. One is called CASP12 short and one long. Remember, all those people, whether they have the short or the long, they are completely healthy individual, essentially. What we think they are completely healthy individual. So when they look to see in the general population if they have CASP12 short or long, you can see in the states, the Caucasian, all of them have the short one. So for sure we are not going to study them because all of them are the same. But if you look <coughs> at the Afro-Americans, you can see essentially that about 80% of them have the short, but about 20% have or heterozygous or homozygous to the, short, uh, the uh, long CASP12. So is this, whether you have a short or a long, make any difference? So first of all, they did a study in the laboratory study. And they, you can see here, all those, those are many kinds of cytokines which are important in the immune response. So you can see if you are homozygous for the long, you can see that everywhere, all the, the various cytokines, you have a lower number than when you are homozygous to the uh, short CASP12. So the question is, does this say anything clinically, whether clinically it's important? So you can see here that if we look of, of African Americans who are admitted to the hospital with sepsis, you can see that the short is only 60%, while I told you before that it's 80% of the general population. So if in, but those who were admitted to the hospital with sepsis, it's 60%, and here the number is much higher. So 40% of those admitted to the hospital with sepsis have or homozygous for the long or are heterozygous. But for sure this is a, a significant number. And the main question is, what happened to those patients? So you can see that if there is death from sepsis, 17% will die if they have the short. But look at this number, more than 50% if you have the long. Meaning, again, this is not the only reason why someone will get a uh, uh, sepsis, but it's quite clear that it, it again shows us that our, our immune system is not as good as we thought, and therefore, if you have the, sh uh, the long CASP12, you are more susceptible to a severe infection. So what jean Laurent Casanova wrote, which I think is the right one, that inborn error of immunity are unfortunately, but un inevitable, the rule rather than the exception. Now, where do we go with it? So I'm sure you will hear, you will hear soon about how to diagnose a, a primary immune deficiency. But what I believe will happen in the future, let's say in about 20, 30 years, I don't know, not in my time for sure, Anyway, what will happen is that once you are born, they will do a check of your genomic to see all the polymorphism. They will make in a calculator to see those genes which give you higher protection, those which give you lower protection. And then, for example, if you come to the hospital with a high fever and they won't know exactly at the beginning what you have, they will say, okay, regarding when we did the screen of your genes, you are more susceptible to bacteria number X and not to bacteria number Y. And therefore, we start antibiotics with this or with other one. Or 
ah, this, your, your immune system is very good, don't worry, it's just a minor viral infection, you can go home. So I believe that, and I'm spe we're speaking about immunity, but essentially it's for all the other kinds, endocrinology, nephrology, whatever you want to, because essentially everything is in our genes. Thank you very much.